Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jim Gibbons, and it's an irony that is not lost on me that here you all are, young people, talking about youth and the engagement of youth in the political process, and here am I, probably, almost certainly, the oldest person in the room. <laughs> now, the only thing I, I would note is that among all the music that you played, there were many that I recognized from when I was your age, when I had hair halfway down my back and a fringed leather jacket, and I used to do head banging and all the rest of it. And the thing is, back then, we believed that we were going to change the world. We could overthrow the system, we could create a new world where everything was different and everything was better and fairer, and there were more human rights. And do you know what happened? We got old. We got old, and all those people you see in the movies of Woodstock, who are wandering around with their long hair and their beads, looking, hey, man, pass the joint, have fun. Uh, they're all retired cost accountants and doctors and bond traders. Um, we thought we could change the world. We couldn't. Don't make the same mistake. You've got to engage, not just in the things that are really exciting, but in the day-to-day nitty-gritty of politics, and that's more difficult. But that's something you've got to do. If you look in my country, in the UK, at the referendum on Scottish independence, 90% of people aged 16 to 18 registered to vote. Now, there's no record of how many of them actually did at the end of the day, and of course, no record on how they voted. But the fact is that the actual turnout was 84.19% in Scotland, 84.19%. That compares with the United Kingdom's overall vote in the European elections of 34.19%. And even in the 2012 presidential election in the United States, the turnout was only 582 So huge, huge turnout. Now, there was some research done, not an awful lot, but the, uh, the British Youth Council asked 570 young people across the UK uh, which way they would have voted if they'd had the vote in the European election. And do you know what? They would have voted for sensible parties. They wouldn't have voted for the extremists and the populists. It's old people who vote for extremists and populists. Old people of my generation, because they're frightened of change. You are not frightened of change, but you've got to achieve that change. <laughs> well, there is some scientific uh, evidence on your side, too. Lawrence Steinberg, who's a professor at the Temple University in Pennsylvania, uh, referred to the maturity of 16-year-olds. And apparently in cold cognition, they call it, and psychologists speak, cold cognition situations where people are not under pressure and they can make a value judgment and take a time over a decision. 16-year-olds are every bit as mature as 18-year-olds and over. They can do that. And, uh, and yet they're, they're largely ignored. But the thing is, science is fine, but as uh, Andrew Lang, the Scottish poet and novelist, once said, the politician uses science in the way the drunken man uses a lamppost, more for support than illumination. <laughs> so, so <laughs> we, today we're talking about youth initiating systems change. That's what this is all about, and I want you all to ask your questions. Um, we've got to build on yesterday's, and earlier in the week's, uh, laboratories, how to increase the participation of young people. I, in Scotland it was easy. They could vote on an emotive issue, yes, no, in, out. But in normal situations, you've got to choose a political party. And they're all led by people like me, grey men in suits, or grey ladies in suits sometimes. But they, they, they are middle-aged people. You've got to choose a party. And to be honest, there's not the huge difference they used to be. Back in the day, parties were very different. You had the parties of capital, the parties of the factory owners. You had the, fact, the, the parties of the landowners. And you had the parties of the workers. And people fought for what they believed in. These days, well, how do you choose between the parties? Most of them, you can't slip a cigarette paper between. They look pretty similar. They sound pretty similar. In the United States, I think I was told by Matt yesterday, they are pretty similar. So that, what you've got to do is pick what sort of policies you want, but also get engaged so you can influence those policies at ground level. Then you've got a party you really want to vote for. And that's important. So we've got to increase the participation and impact of youth. Look at how to turn the innate enthusiasm and civil responsibility of young people into an engagement in political action. And we've got to get, this is the important part, and this is probably the most difficult part, we've got to get the leaders to listen, and not only to listen, but to actually accept the changes that you're asking for and the way the system operates so that you have not just a voice, but a voice that people listen to and 
make changes because of. You've got to influence them, but to do that, you've got to get engaged. So, right, I've, I've, I've shut up now. I'm going to introduce the guests, and they will then speak to you, each of them, for about five minutes. Uh, so, let me see. I've got to put my glasses on for this. I told you I'm the oldest person in the room. Dmitry, Dmitry Bolotov at the far end there. A minister for youth and sports in Ukraine. He was an active member, very active member, of the Automedan protest that eventually caused the president at the time, Viktor Yanukovych, to flee the country. During his time as an activist, he was kidnapped and severely tortured by pro-Russian forces, trying to make him say that the whole protest was funded by the Americans. He has a long history of launching initiatives in the fields of sport, youth programs, and social development. He chairs the NGO Socially Responsible Society, and he was appointed to his current post in February by the Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk. Daniela Chacon is uh, there. There we go. <laughs> She's Vice Mayor of Quito in Ecuador and a member of Quito's Council. Incidentally, you may be interested to know that in Ecuador, it's one of the very few countries in the world where 16-year-olds have the vote. They're not forced to vote. Once they get to 18, they have to. But uh, they, they have the vote at 16. Not many countries have that. She served as a political analyst and has worked advising the private sector in the creation of public-private partnerships for economic and social development in Ecuador and the state of Colorado in the United States. Her interest in public affairs led her to co-found a youth political movement in her home country where youth were encouraged to actively participate in civic affairs and influence public policy decisions. That's, some, that, that's something you've got to get a grip on yourselves. She holds a master's in uh, public administration from the George Washington University where she attended as a Fulbright scholar and she holds a, a law degree from Universidad San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador. Right, we move to the gentleman sitting on my left here. Filip Dimitrov was Prime Minister of Bulgaria from 1991 to 92. He's been active in the campaign to topple the communist rule. During his premiership, his government got the new democratic institutions to work and embarked on an ambitious set of political and economic reforms, also establishing human rights, and this is very important, as the legal and ethical norm in Bulgaria. After his premiership, he continued to serve in the Bulgarian parliament and as deputy speaker of the Bulgarian National Assembly, is an active member of the Club of Madrid, which is an organization of former democratically elected presidents and prime ministers who work together for the good of citizens and democracy. Well then, uh, we have Matt Leininger. Uh, uh, I'm there, yes. <laughs> um, executive director of the Liberative Democracy Consortium in the United States. Uh, the DCC is a network of leading scholars representing more than 50 foundations, non-profit organizations, and universities collaborating in the field of deliberative democracy in North America and around the world. He recently led a working group that produced a model ordinance on public participation and developed a new tool, Text, Talk, and Act, to combine texting and face-to-face -face engagement as part of President Obama's National Dialogue on Mental Health. Now then, I hope I'm going to get the pronunciation of the names right here. This is where we start to get difficult. <laughs> Menrika Moshiska Dendis. Right. Okay. Appointed Under Secretary of State in Poland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs in April last year. She's in charge of European policy, human rights, and parliamentary affairs. Prior to that, she served as Director of the European Policy Department from 2012 and Deputy Director of this department responsible for institutional affairs in Northern Europe from 2011 to 2012. Excuse me. Her previous postings include Copenhagen and Berlin. And finally, Natasha uh, Vushkovic, at the far end there. <laughs> right. Member of Serbia's National Assembly, also member of Serbia's standing delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. An excellent assembly it is, too. I've attended it many times as a journalist. Uh, she chairs the Committee on Rules and Internal Affairs. In parliamentary committees in Serbia, she has a particular interest in foreign affairs and European integration. She was involved in founding the Centre for Democracy, a non-governmental organisation for the development of civil society, and she tries to encourage public engagement in political processes. Now then, what we need now is a, a chat from each of them. Uh, we're going to start with Dmitry Bulatov, and if you've got headphones in front of you, you should put them on now if you don't speak Russian, because Mr Bulatov, is, he speaks English, but he wants to give his... his address in Russian, which is fine. So uh, I, wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to give an address in Russian, I can tell you. So here we go. Right, if you put your headphones on, you'll be able to hear. Mr. Bulatov. Let me welcome all of you. And to begin with, I would like to thank the Council of Europe for the support that it has extended to Ukraine and Ukrainians in their attempt to integrate with Europe, and also 
in uh, going down the path of democracy and uh, offering more potential to young people. We thank the Council of Europe for, find it, for helping the peoples of different nations to find a common language, to respect one another and to come closer together not only on everyday issues, but also in difficult, conflictual situations. Ukrainians are strong in spirit. Ukrainians will become a worthy member of the European family. Ukrainians will treat all human beings as human beings. Human beings are at the very core and the center of the transforming processes uh, occurring in our country. The state is for the people and not the people for the state. We are all interested in supporting our own families, our nations, and we all want to show through our individual examples that democracy is a priority in the life of our society. Ukraine is undergoing transformation. Young people, young people's organizations and other non-governmental organizations are growing in strength in Ukraine. And the changes that have occurred have really given an impetus to young people and young people are at the heart of what is being done. We have uh, Express TV, Gramatska TV and many other social networks that are being used by young people. Uh, these uh, initiatives are driving change and there are many other initiatives run by young people in the cultural sphere and others. A lot of young people have uh, joined the ranks of the decision makers. For instance, Tatiana Chernomova is uh, responsible for combating corruption. Igor Sobolev is uh, one of the drafters of the act Руководитель общественной инициативы реанимационной пакетов. На сегодняшний день выбран депутатом Верховного Совета. И на Сосун Верховного Совета Украины обновился на 54%. Of the parliament Это исторический has, uh, показатель. Changed, uh, Примерно половина народных депутатов – люди в возрасте members. до 40 лет. Uh, Это и предприниматели, и журналисты, и активисты. Uh, Они приносят новое видение и новые подходы. Uh, больше молодых, молодых людей во власти, больше контроля за средствами и планами правительства. <coughs> информационной и гуманитарной политики. Труднее прятать информацию, строить коррупционные схемы, тем, кто к этому привык гадать. через молодежное предпринимательство. На первый взгляд, смешной пример, но производство одежды, украшений, аксессуаров, сувениров с украинской символикой набрало больших оборотов. И это открыло дополнительные возможности для молодых инициативных людей. На текущий момент это пользуется огромной популярностью. Министерство молодежи и спорта которое я возглавляю, активно сотрудничает с молодежными организациями, вовлекает молодежные организации и молодежь в такие проекты, как молодежный работник, совместные программы с программой развития ООН, Советом Европы, американскими советами и многими другими. Implemented jointly на with the United Nations, with the Council of Europe, and with various uh, American organizations. Вперед, so we really have moved forward, тех, we have made progress, лидером, and to go even further, тех, we must make людей, sure that all uh, 
people who have won the trust of the society uh, will act in a dignified and corrupt free way. It's very difficult to change a system that has brought corruption right down into the roots of society. But we do believe in freedom of speech, in human rights, in democracy, and in full transparency as the best way of gaining strength on our path to a better future. We are convinced that Ukrainians will soon live much better than they did in the past. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. We move on now to Daniela Chacon. Good morning to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here because uh, I want to say hi also to my fellow panelists. And I want to apologize for my English. It's been a while, so bear with me. Um, so I've been hearing this couple of few days, uh, what are our problems? And um, I think there are two or three that are the most relevant and the ones that are coming and coming uh, again and again. Um, there's apathy and a sense of distrust of the political system. Uh, and uh, youth issues are not discussed and we don't have access to decision making in government or political parties. So we're here to um, try to figure out what do we do about these issues. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about my, my country and some figures that I think will be relevant and that also probably are pretty uh, true in your countries as well. Um, so we have a very young country. Our average age is 28 years old. And um, in 2013, we ran a survey on young people until uh, up to 35 years old. And in that survey, we were, we were asking about, you know, how interested are you in politics and how willing are you to participate in politics? And uh, we found out that only 15% of youth are interested in politics. And then uh, we also find, found out something that is uh, much more worrying about, and that people are not, there's a lack of understanding of what democracy and politics is. And um, we are very anti-system. 77% of young women in Ecuador said that they don't want to participate in politics, that they don't want to be in any political party. And 69% of young men said the same thing. So in my country, and I'm pretty sure this is true for many other countries, young people are not, are not really thinking about engaging in politics. Um, there's very few of us. I mean, here, uh, all of us that are sitting here, we are an exception. We are probably a very small percentage of all of those other young people that are, that are disengaged, that are really anti-system, that they don't believe that they, the system can change. And therefore, why do I participate if I cannot really make a change? So I just want to make um, a little survey here so that we can get a sense if this is true or not, uh, even in, in this group that is very, very engaged. Uh, first, I would like to know how many here under 35 are public elected officers? Can you please raise your hands? So we're very few. <laughs> um, and uh, I also would like to know how many of you, of you are planning to run for office? So there's a little bit more, <laughs> but not as much as we think it should be in a group of very engaged young people, in a group of uh, young people that are really wanting to change the system, that really want us to have a voice. So this is what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, few, uh, a year ago, I decided that it, 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 if I wanted change, then I had to join the system. And so I joined a party it was very difficult to find one that I was much more inclined to. Um, parties are very, <laughs> you know, they're very, uh, parties in my country are very old, but in the past few years we've had a change. We had, uh, we have three new parties, and in one of those three parties I found uh, a place where I, I, I thought I, I belong more than in the, any of the others, and I decided to run for office, and I won. And that has been an amazing experience, but um, there's very few of us that really make that choice. 
And I understand why. I was also that type of person that was a little bit disengaged, even though I, I've always liked politics and I've always been working um, in civil society, I, I thought that there was, there was a need to take that further step and participate in politics. And it's not easy. First, it's not easy to find a party that you can relate to, uh, especially when you talk about countries with very, very uh, old parties that do not represent youth issues. But if you don't enter the system, how can you change it? If uh, one of the things that I found very, very difficult is, and trust me, it's, it's, it's not gonna be easy for those of you who make this decision. Every single day, I am challenged by my, my decision, and I'm thinking, is this really <laughs> what I want? Is this really the way to change things? Um, am, am I gonna be able to make a difference? And I think it is possible. It's, it's not gonna be easy, and it, there's definitely the, the sense of uh, the difficulty of changing the system, and, and the challenges of fighting in usual politics. But if we don't enter the game, if we don't penetrate the system, then how can we change it? How can we really change the system if we don't participate? And I know that participating through civil society is a very good way to do it. You can actually influence um, policy making, but it's not gonna be as impactful and it's not gonna be as quicker if you go into politics and if you go and participate in elections. And that's why I want to encourage you to think about that and take that step, um, knowing that it's not gonna be easy, knowing that it's going to be a very difficult fight, uh, knowing that um, you're gonna be a minority, but little by little, you won't be a minority. And I, before finishing, I just wanna say uh, just two, two things that Jim um, mentioned when he first started speaking. Let's don't wait to get old, seriously. <laughs> Let's don't wait to get old to make, the, to take this, this step to make this decision. And uh, just, you know, find a place where you think you can belong. Find a party that uh, will allow you to grow. Um, I found one in my country. It's not difficult. It, you just, you know, I, there's a lot of, there's this issue that political parties don't allow for young people to be on the decision table. And that's not truth for everybody. Um, I found it in my, I'm actually on the national directive of, of the party, and I'm actually in the place where uh, we make decisions in the party. So there's, there's a place. Uh, every country has a, its own dynamic, but if you, are, if you look for that place and if you fight for that place, you can make it happen. So I just want to encourage you to think about stepping into politics and to make, and, you know, make, the, make, make the changes from within. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, now, Philip Dimitrov. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, I would just like to make a few observations. You know, it was said that many young people are not interested in blah, 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 blah in politics. I guess still you're not the only ones. I guess in all your countries we can find probably a few million people who would uh, take interest. Is that true? In all these countries you represent. So, uh, I have heard a lot of things about direct democracy during these days. And I'm sure that there will be some people who would uh, propose that we make a kind of a super Twitter operation here and have all these few million people communicating and contacting and uh, participating in what is here, the decision making. As a matter of fact, this is not the most sophisticated decision making, you would agree. But you have not opted for this. You are here. And my first observation is that by virtue of the physical presence of your bodies in this room, you have voted in favor of representative democracy, period. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, uh, you know, you always has a big temptation um, to be in a hurry. I was 36 when I became prime minister. At 40, I was former prime minister, former president of the party, former leader of the opposition, former leader of a revolution, anything you, you wish. I can tell you this is a tough job, being the former leader, and here I represent the club of former political leaders. Being former at 40 is a tough thing. I don't 
necessarily advise you to, to be in a hurry to get into this position. But democracy is about becoming the former. Democracy is about people coming from into power and going out, etc. So make your minds and decide. You may be in a hurry, you may be kind of a slow walker. It's a matter of decision, but know that one day you will be former. That's it. Well, uh, talking about temptation, uh, there is always a temptation with youth to, to say we are different. I remember how different I was from my father. Now when I look into the mirror, I see his face all the time, but anyway. Uh, being different is inevitable. But the temptation is that you decide that we will make a different type of human being. You've heard some very interesting statements in this room a few days ago about a new breed of people who will be looking at three computers at one and the same time, who will don't care about property, etc., uh, etc. Et Unfortunately, this brand new song is as old as the world. In the 20th century, we've heard it at least twice. We had the Nazis who were making a new kind of man. We had the communists who were making a new type of homo sovieticus. And fortunately, all failed. Running against human nature is, uh, and, and trying to, to change the nature of humans is a temptation which is not a privilege to you, young people. It is a privilege to everybody in the past seven or 8,000 years. And uh, don't get trapped into this. But the one thing I would like to mention is that uh, I've seen uh, this beautiful performance you, you made uh, a few minutes ago, uh, all these beautiful uh, young women and young men moving and dancing, and I was thinking of how important it is to be able to act out our feelings. And in fact, a good part of our life in creative thinking, in arts, in uh, events like this is about acting out some feelings. Remember this money, 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 and remember the faces. Uh, this is great. Or uh, breaking the wall, let the kids them go. These are strong feelings we all have. Democracy, however, is not only about freedom. It is about the capacity using your freedom to control the child in yourself, and if we agree that human nature is not changing that easily, the destructive tendencies of the child in you. So, there is always a temptation to act out. I mean, politics is to a certain extent a performance. So, of course, you have the urge to do this. What you should probably have in mind in your future career before you become farmers will be that these are things you should probably think of controlling. Democracy is not let, uh, lack of control. Pretty much like democracy is not any of the democratic trends. It is not necessarily conservative. It is by far not necessarily socialist. Democracy is just democracy. It is freedom and responsibility. Yes, thank, thanks very much indeed, uh, uh, Philip. Um, and certainly, if anyone wants to put the sort of energy that went into that performance into a political life, then uh, maybe they really, really will change the world. But we're going to move on now to uh, Menrika Mosiska Dendis uh, from Poland, who's going to speak next. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Good morning and hello to, uh, to everyone. Uh, you won't be surprised that I'll be doing some PR for my own country, for, for Poland, and the, the projects on democracy and participation we've uh, started in, uh, in Warsaw. 2014 is a very special year for, uh, for Poland. Uh, as uh, many of you probably know, 25 years ago, back in 1989, the democratic transformation began, uh, not only in Poland, but also in 
in many other many other countries of, of Central Europe. And the spirit of, of solidarity and the active engagement of the society, uh, including youngsters, were key factors for a successful and peaceful change at, at that time. I remember myself, I was 13 and I was running uh, around back in 1981 with leaflets and posters for the Solidarność or Solidarity Movement candidates who were running for the first time in, uh, in quasi-democratic uh, uh, elections. And uh, uh, since the transformation in Poland uh, was, was a rather successful one, we are proud of that and we want to share our, our experiences. Uh, and uh, in particular, the unique experience of a non-violent struggle for democracy, for freedom, uh, for civic society participation. And uh, therefore, the democracy promotion and human rights are obviously in the forefront of uh, Polish foreign policy. And Warsaw has more and more the ambition of becoming a hub for uh, democracy-related activities and, and debates. You won't be surprised that this is why, uh, why we have uh, established a special forum for, uh, for discussions on democracy-related issues called the Warsaw Dialogue for Democracy, a yearly conference which is taking place in autumn uh, in, uh, in Warsaw and where we try to invite each year um, bloggers, young activists, democratic leaders from all over the world uh, to share experiences, to exchange best practices, uh, to speak about lessons learned from all over the, uh, the world. And uh, it's my pleasure also to invite you uh, immediately to, to the next year's uh, uh, edition. We have a special web page for the Warsaw Dialogue where you can find all the uh, information about the, uh, the conference. It's needless to say that, that uh, we focus on the, on the young people uh, participation because basically you, the, uh, the voice of the future, people aged from uh, between 15 and 25 represent one-fifth of the world's population and they also constitute, uh, you also constitute a great potential and you, you are able to generate immense energy and bring a change about. Uh, it's impossible to address any major challenges while marginalizing young uh, people. Therefore, the question of participation we are to, to discuss here during the uh, World Democracy Forum is, is so crucial. And it's my pleasure to be here again and to be able to, uh, to, to discuss uh, uh, with you. I think it's our joint uh, role uh, to build capacities for young, activities, uh, for young activists and, and promote uh, youth uh, uh, activities. Mobilization and empowerment of youth are definitely essential for creating a culture of participation, supporting active uh, citizens uh, who engage at various uh, level and who care simply. And therefore, the, the issue of youth participation was also reflected during the third edition of the Warsaw Dialogue for Democracy, which took place uh, two weeks ago in, uh, in Warsaw. We're very grateful also to the Council of Europe for, for active participation in the, uh, in the event. As I said, the, the Warsaw Dialogue for Democracy is already a, a firm brand and uh, we want it to become even, uh, even stronger. Uh, last year we concentrated on, on social media and the role of modern technology. This year the focus was on uh, shrinking space for civic society. Uh, but the participants uh, discussed also various other uh, issues starting with uh, advancing women leadership and the participation of women in, uh, in public life, transitional justice or, or democracy support. And uh, I'm proud to bring you a few uh, recommendations the, uh, the participants of the conference uh, formulated in, in Warsaw. Uh, the they formulated 13 recommendations this year, but I'll uh, focus on, on uh, only four. But I encourage you to, to go to the, uh, uh, and have a look at the, at the web page uh, where all the recommendations can be found. But I find a uh, few of them uh, really important. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, is the full respect for human rights partnership, uh, solidarity and the inclusiveness and participation in public affairs. The other, the full respect for freedom of expression, association an assembly, a favor of nonviolent struggle for democracy and freedom, full participation and inclusion of women in democratic processes, and gender equality and women's empowerment. And you won't be surprised that the last one is, uh, is focusing on the potential offered by social media tools. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. It's really a pleasure to be here with you again. Thank you. 
Right, so we now move on to Matt Leininger. Would you like to speak for a while, Matt? Thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks also to the World Forum organizers. I'm very happy to be here, honored. And thank you also to the performers this morning. I was quite inspired by both of the presentations. And I want to try to follow that and add a little bit to, to some of those um, performances uh, and also return to something that uh, Professor Landemore said yesterday, a very nice term that she used when she said post-representative democracy. I like that term because it's an admission of reality. The fact that all over the world, people don't just want to be represented. And Mr. Dmitrov is right. It doesn't mean we want to eradicate parliaments and presidents. We want to keep our republican rights and structures, but we want democratic rights and structures as well. We want rights and structures that allow us to take part in decision making, problem solving, and community. And I like that term post-representative democracy also because it's a, an invitation to envision what that means. What would be the elements of democratic participation infrastructure that would go along with the Republican infrastructure we have. We've heard a lot of ideas like that at this conference, um, and I'll just name just a few. Uh, participatory budgeting, hyper-local online forums, youth councils, uh, participation commissions, crowdsourcing, wiki mapping, citizen juries, uh, federal policy conferences, uh, online deliberation, many varieties of face-to-face -face deliberation. Uh, serious games, uh, GIS-based problem solving like See, Click, Fix and Fix My Street. There's many, many others I could name uh, and many others that, that are represented at the conference and, and in other parts of the world. A good resource for finding out more about them is, is participedia.net. But what's interesting about these things not just, is not just that they are temporary processes. That's, most of them have been temporary ad hoc kinds of processes subsidiary to the Republican structures in their countries but they all are potentially elements of democratic participation infrastructure. And we ought to be thinking about them that way and including them in our visions of what democracy could look like. What kind of democracies do we want? I also want to point out a couple things about this. Many of these um, ideas are kind of examples of thick participation. That they take place in small groups. They require people to share experiences and weigh options and talk about planning for action. They require a significant emotional, intellectual, and time commitment from citizens. Some of them are thin forms of participation. They're quick, they're fast, they often take place online. Uh, they're easier, they're done by people generally as individuals. And there's been a debate at this conference and in many other places as well between people who think one type is better than the other. People who are fans of thick forms of participation who say, well, what is, well all this Facebooking and texting and liking and you know, clicktivism, this doesn't help us. And people who are fans of the thinner forms and say, oh, who needs all these boring long meetings? That debate should stop. <laughs> it's not a helpful debate. And the fact is that these are simply two different forms of communication, two different forms of participation that have their own strengths and weaknesses. And in fact, they work better when they are combined, when you can create structures and processes that have both thick, both thick and thin opportunities for people to participate. I got a chance um, <coughs> last year to, to do some of that kind of experimentation to create something that included thick and thin uh, types of participation as part of President Obama's National Dialogue on Mental Health. And basically what we created to complement the many thick forms, face-to-face -face forms of participation that were taking place was this thing called text, talk, and act. And essentially what our invitation was to anyone who wanted to participate was that on this one day, all you need to do is get together with three other people and text in start to this particular number. And as soon as you start texting in, you begin to get texts back. Every text in comes a text back. Some of the texts are polling kinds of questions. What do you think about this issue? People can answer A, B, and C. Uh, quickly after you answer a few of those using your smartphone, you get a link showing you the results of what all these other people in other parts of the country said to the very same question in real time. Then you got a set of discussion questions which got people to talk to each other face to face. Why did they care about mental health? What experiences did they have? Why did they want to do about it on their, on their campuses and their communities? Getting people to kind of actually engage with one another and following the kind of the, the tried and true sequence of participation of giving people a chance to talk about why they care 
then giving them a chance to talk about different options or viewpoints, and then giving people a chance to, to plan for action. So once people had, had uh, taken part of the, that kind of face-to-face -face discussion, then the last few texts got them talking about action. In addition to, to answering more of the polling questions, they could also say specific ideas, text in specific ideas, things that they were going to commit to doing on their campuses and their communities. So again, they were able to then get a link which showed them what people were doing in other, or committing to in other parts of the country. I'm, I'm giving you this illustration not to say that this was a perfect process, but simply to say that that type of experimentation is what we need, one of the things we need to do. Combining ways that we can use the technology for what it is good for, use the, the kind of the face-to-face -face types of, of deliberation and participation for what they're good for. We've had um, up to, I think, close to 10,000 people take part in this process so far. One of the things that I take from that, just, just to wrap up, Jim, one of the things is that thick and thin combinations can work. The other thing is that what we created without really necessarily knowing it was a venue, an opportunity that was open to everyone, but that young people were particularly good at because the technology was native to them. They knew how to do this. They knew how to use the, 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 the smartphones. And I think that is also a thing that we need more of as we think about what kind of democracy we want. We don't just need opportunities that are just for young people. Those may be great. We also need opportunities that are open to everyone, but which will capitalize on the potential and capacity of young people to be leaders today, not just leaders for tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Matt. And we move on to our last, but by no means least, uh, speaker today, before you get the chance to start putting some questions to the panel here, and that is Natasha Vushkovich. Thank you, Mr. Gibbons. Um, well, good morning all. It's a very big pleasure for me to be uh, with you during these three days. It's a very provocative, empowering, and encouraging event. At the same time, uh, I, I, I have to share with you the disappointment I had when at the opening of the forum, uh, I posted on my Facebook, Facebook profile the information about the opening of the forum and uh, tried to send the messages about, well, its objectives and so on. And, uh, well, the negative and the most cynical comments that I got on Facebook actually came from my young Facebook friends. And uh, uh, the message that I wanted to convey actually was uh, protected and uh, uh, in a way differently uh, uh, communicated by mid-generation Facebook friends. What I want uh, by this to say is that certainly there is a big disappointment uh, with democracy, and particularly in Serbia, you know, which is uh, now in the process of uh, uh, accession negotiations with the European Union, there is certainly a growing disappointment with the fact that democracy and the reforms initiated some 14 years ago have not brought uh, rapid uh, and expected results so far. Nevertheless, I think that certainly this uh, uh, um, feeling that uh, democracy, well, is not that relevant today, which is shared by so many young people, is one of the most important threats to our endeavors and the, most, uh, the biggest challenge that we have in front of us. And I think that together, no matter whether we are young, mid-generation uh, 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 mid or elderly, that we should fight uh, together against this feeling and this, we should fight against uh, rising violence and intolerance that uh, uh, comes together with populism and extreme rights, uh, which uh, uh, offers rapid responses that in times of crisis we uh, somehow tend to embrace uh, very easily. I think that we have praised very much the digitalized world that we uh, all live in and certainly we have to embrace uh, their advance, uh, their op its opportunities. But at the same time, we have to be aware that it, this digitalized world actually encourages us to search for those rapid responses and that the time for reflection is uh, uh, smaller and smaller. I uh, saw one of the cartoons in front of this uh, uh, hemicycle which says, we have to think how to revitalize and reinvent democracy. We have two hours in order to do so. So this is actually the, the time frame in which we are all forced to, to, to work. Uh, regarding the uh, political activity of young people, 
I certainly uh, share the uh, opinion that local initiatives and grassroots activities are very important because it provides uh, the youth with uh, uh, opportunities to learn, to participate, to uh, uh, take active part in some local institutions. That's very important. But at the same time, I'm pretty much doubtful whether a, a change can be made, can be produced in a time where, well, everything is so much centralized and when the most important process is actually transcending the national lines. Uh, regarding the participation of young in the national institutions, particularly in political parties, I do share the dilemma of, uh, uh, of uh, my predecessor in this round table when she said that she keeps on uh, asking herself whether political activity is worthwhile. I'm 25 years in politics and I still ask myself that a question, but I'm still persuaded that it is worthwhile. Uh, we, what we have to do in order to attract young people, it is that uh, uh, we have to democratize our political parties. And uh, I need to share with you my impression that youth branches that usually exist in political parties uh, do not uh, uh, fill that role that is, that is uh, very often uh, searched by uh, 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 young people that want to join the political parties. The, the pattern of the older people in the party are very easily actually reflected and uh, taken over by these youth branches. I think that we should much more work together. There is this intergenerational gap that I think we have together, uh, we have to work together in order to uh, uh, prevent them from, from widening. I think that the problems that we have today do not belong only to youth or to mid-generation or to elderly. Those are problems that we have to address uh, together. Uh, what I think is very important on the national level is that uh, we seek that, the, uh, many years ago we started talking about the gender mainstreaming, meaning that all sectoral policies should embrace uh, gender dimension. Uh, uh, in each of the policies. I think that we should today speak about youth mainstreaming on how to in, in, uh, incorporate youth priorities in all policies that we, uh, that we uh, address at national level. Uh, recently, Serbia has been hit by immense floods. And I think that the message that we all uh, uh, had from it was actually the role of youth. The young generation got together in a spontaneous manner through social networks. They managed to save lives of so many people that were in danger. They managed to collect and distribute the aid to all those that were displaced. With that kind of activity, they showed what sometimes we, we don't think it exists, a large solidarity, empathy, uh, and the message that they actually uh, uh, sent to all of us was, we are here, we are committed to our societies, and we want to be useful for our societies. But the question that follows then is, how can we be really useful for our societies if we are so much unemployed? And I do believe that democracy ha cannot flourish in poverty, and that is the the, the problem that we have to face is our priorities. As someone said, we live in a society and not in the economy. Thank you. Natasha, thank you very much indeed. We're now opening the floor to questions. I would just like to make one point. The Winston Churchill once said, the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. Um, but obviously, he should have started speaking to some of the young people instead. There's a gentleman over there who wants to ask questions, or lots of people. We'll start with you, sir. Could you uh, identify yourself, see where you're from, and then ask your question to whichever member of the panel you like? Sure. Hello. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Shashank. I'm representing world's largest democracy, India, and I'm also a member of the world's largest youth organization, ISEC. Uh, my question is for the whole panel. I reckon in India, where we have representative democracy, young people are tad cynical of a two-political party system, which is dominated by the two major parties. So and when it comes to youth representation to form opinion and work for a better democracy, we are deprived of representation. There are some small groups and, uh, which are represented by youth, but they eventually turn up being members of the youth wing of these two political parties. So I want to know that 
whether these small groups will, get a, will ever get a chance to become the members of these political parties or otherwise form different parties and, uh, and uh, represent the whole consensus of the youth people. Thank you. That's an interesting question. Let's take two or three, and then we'll, we'll answer them all en masse. Uh, somebody over there, I think, was the next, uh, next person to ask a question. Say who you are, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Vyacheslav Kretso. I'm coming from Republic of Moldova, and I'm pre representing the Youth Bank of the District Calabi. I want to address this question to the Mr. Philip, as I was impressed of his uh, perspective view on the youth policies. So, as you've mentioned, that uh, we, young people, are running fastly somewhere, and uh, we want to get something done very quickly, and we are open to learn and get experience. And here is the question. Why don't we then combine your high political potential and experience as a politician with our ambitions and powerful ideas to run this world. Because as never before, again, as never before, we need your support, your confidence, and your guidance, as we did when we vote for you. Thank you. OK, um, I'm going to ask some more people to uh, pose their questions. But could you, like this last gentleman, could you please stand up when you do? Otherwise, the, the, the cameras can't see you. Stand over there. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. This is Sagar from, uh, again, India. We have been divided, sadly. We have been divided into nationalities, religions, races, last not, not the least, into deep economic inequalities. I want to ask you, who are these people? Who are these people who are controlling all our resources in the world? Who are these people who do not want to end poverty and global suffering? Thank you. Okay. I think maybe, uh, maybe we should get an answer here before we move on to the next question. So, uh, Matt, would you like to go first? <laughs> throw you into the deep end, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer any of them. <laughs> but, but I don't, I, one of them I think was, was, developed, was aimed particularly at Mr. Dimitrov. Why don't we start with him? Okay. Hey, off you go. Okay. Uh, first of all, about the two-party system. I have now in uh, my parliament eight parties. They're trying to make government still. I don't know how successful they will be. Judging from the Belgian experience, about eight parties in Parliament usually give you a span of six to nine months of forming a government. From every democratic standards, having a government that has been voted out lingering for about a year is not very uh, promising. Well, a country like uh, a country in which things are well settled, like the example was Belgium, can afford it, and democracy doesn't suffer because people don't really mention the government. You know, people don't think much about governments when they're happy, the weather is fine, uh, the, the, the market is full of uh, uh, goods, and they're on uh, acceptable prices. They usually start thinking about the governments when some of these things are not there. I'm afraid in my country there are a number of things which are not there, so I suppose that this will be a big debate about having a government. With two parties, it is much easier. Whether these parties will open to you or not is something which does not necessarily have to do with whether they are two or twenty. It has to do with what is their structure, how the institutions are functioning, what are the traditions of the country, etc. And here we actually come to the Moldovan question, it, which is uh, how can we combine the experience, I mean, to the extent that, we, that both sides wish to. I mean, 
when I was in uh, uh, the position, I was not that much experienced. I was uh, belonging to your group, as I told you, I was 36. I know people can manage. And in the same time, in order to manage, you just don't want to get in by, by a quota or by some kind of uh, uh, in being empowered by, by the party leadership of some place, you try to make your way. In quite a number of cases, you fail. Sometimes you succeed not because you're the better, but because you have the made, made a right choice at the right time. It's like going to an exam. You may know a lot and still not pass the exam because of bad luck. Bad luck exists. If you don't understand this, there is no room for democracy. And this is why when I hear a question like the one, who are these people who permit that suffering continues to exist? Oh my God, I've heard a lot of this in the 20th century. You're not that brand new. I mean, they were abolishing suffering, they were abolishing poverty, they were abolishing all pain and trouble and we have seen that it ended up in rivers of blood. So, let's go back down to the earth. Hitler had a very good idea about uh, who is the one that makes the world uh, continue to suffer. And he pointed out somebody and created the concentration camps. Don't do this, please. Yes, Daniela, please. I wanted to answer the question about the two political party system um, and the youth wings. I first, you know, I would say run away from those parties that have youth wings uh, <laughs> because that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have an access to the decision making in the party. But I do understand that there are some countries that don't only have two parties, like India. My country has a lot of parties. Uh, but and so you don't have many options <laughs> in this case, so you will have to uh, penetrate the party so that you can actually make a change. I would say, um, you know, the leaders in, the, in, in, in political parties might not understand uh, minorities, women, youth, uh, and those approaches, but they understand both. That's what they definitely understand. And you know, the world in many places is getting younger and younger and younger. And if you are not, if, if as a party are not able to, um, you know, to, um, to be able to represent those, those minorities and those, that growing population, then you are a party is going to disappear and, and a new one will come or a, or a renewed one will come. And I would say that that's uh, an example that is happening all around the world in, in, in different countries. So. Uh, even if, if you only have two parties, and even if you think it's going to be difficult, um, I think there's a room for change. It's going to take time, but um, I think it's not impossible. Thanks very much indeed, Daniela. I'd just like to make the point. I was actually, Philip was referring to Belgium with its um, multi party system and the fact that nobody could form a majority. And we went through quite a long period there with no government at all. And most of my Belgian neighbours uh, said to me, ah, the country's never been run better. And it's because there was no government. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, don't ever try. <laughs> but, but, don't necessarily make the mistake of trusting the bureaucrats to run it forever. I had an uncle who covered the Chinese Revolution for a British newspaper uh, as a journalist, and uh, he said the tragedy of all revolutions is that once the revolutionaries say, hey, we've won, and put down their guns and go home to their farms and their fields, the bureaucrats take over, and that's when the, the dead hand of bureaucracy gets a grip on governance. That's something to avoid. Okay, let's, say, let's take another question. Um, yes, I, I know there's a gentleman over there who's been waving at the back. If you'd like to stand up, sir, and say who you are. Jacques Burtualadze, Georgia. Uh, sorry, we've got two people. Actually, the gentleman okay. behind you. I'll come to you in a moment, if I may. Yep. <laughs> Please. From the Tunisian Polytechnic School, I'd like, first of all, to pay tribute to two recent revolutions for democracy that have taken place, the Ukrainian Revolution and the Tunisian Revolution. These are two recent revolutions, and they need the support of the democracy as a whole. And I'd also like to 
here in this chamber to pay tribute jeunes, to our martyrs, to the young people, to the casualties of the Tunisian revolution. And I'd like to pay tribute to young bon. people who are continuing to suffer. We have signed up to a democratic process, and this democratic process is evolving and uh, is set to continue to evolve. The proof of this is the elections that were recently held, the general elections uh, recently held in Tunisia that were very successful despite all the criticism that can be leveled at uh, Tunisia. I'd like to put a few questions to these speakers. Je voudrais, uh, I'd like to question, uh, la question sur put le as my first question one on Europe and the, the democracy uh, so far as uh, fledging democracies are concerned. Now, I'm talking about support rather than intervention. There is a tendency to uh, mix up uh, uh, both uh, concepts, and this uh, may well occur. The second point I wanted to make, uh, we uh, talk about uh, democracy as such. There can be no democracy without to democratic Donc, political parties. Agence, I think, therefore, that if we want to move to a democracy within a country, if we want to make this transition, political parties need to undergo full democratization. This is very important indeed. Very short, so let's keep the question Dernière short. Question. My Dernière last question. question is if there are no economic projects, what is the worth of democracy, especially in terms of the impact this has on young people? I think really uh, the big, big democracies have to help us here. just in front of you who was going to ask a question as well. I'll move to other parts of the house in a moment. Thank you again. Uh, I want to um, thank Mr. Dimitrov for saying that being just by physically having our bodies here, we're participating. But I also think that we can make a little bit more by just picking up and doing something. So I just want to ask uh, people that there is a big tragedy going on right now. Today people are dying from war, not somewhere far away from this place like Australia or Argentina, in the member countries of the Council of Europe. And I want to ask the floor here, who can recognize the country who has occupied parts of the neighbor to the south who has annexed a huge region to the east of it and who has set up a separatist uh, government to the east of it. What, do you know the name of this country? Anybody? No, it's not Russia. I was talking about Nazi Germany when it occupied Sudeten to the south of it, like Russia did in uh, Georgia. Uh, as it uh, annexed uh, Austria, like Russia annexed Crimea, and as it set up a Vichy government, puppet government in France, like it did in Ukraine, in eastern part of Ukraine. I'm not saying that Russia is a uh, Nazi country, but I'm just saying that there ca can be a huge tragedy coming over uh, to all of our uh, homes. And please do tell us, what are you doing to prevent this? and just don't close eyes for it. And especially, I'm very disappointed that the representative of Ukraine government is not saying these words instead of me. There's a war in your country. What's wrong with you, man? Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. I, I, there are lots of other questions. I would just say, could you please try to keep the questions short? We're getting speeches and said, as well as questions here, and they need to be questions, please. Lady there, uh, in the blue. So, Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am from Turkey. Uh, I have a question. And talk about the democracy is not freedom, democracy is capacity. My question is, all political, general political party leaders are men. My question is, where is the woman democracy process? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll take one more question before we move on to, uh, there's a lady sitting there with a hand up, uh, next to the gentleman with his hand up. Yes, yes, please. I could you stand up, please, to ask your question? Sure, hello, my name is Elisar Arbashir. I come from Bulgaria. I also have Palestinian origins. I'm uh, representing uh, two civil society organizations in Bulgaria. I have a very short comment and a question. Um, uh, Ms. Chacon mentioned that in order to change the system, you should become part of it. However, we have witnessed quite a lot of examples of people entering the system with good intentions and finally going out very corrupt. And basically those good intentions didn't turn out the way they were supposed to be. So my, my question is how 
do we guarantee that once we enter the system, we keep those good intentions and we behave as role models, becoming from a civil society which is supposed to guarantee that we are the role models? Thank you. Okay, good question. I, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to give that one to, uh, to you, Dmitri. Please, Dmitri, sorry. Because there was a question about Ukraine there specifically, so I think you're the man to answer it. No hate and no violence. На таких принципах была построена революция достоинства, произошедшая в декабре и январе в Украине. На таких принципах Украина интегрируется в Европейский Союз. And those are the principles uh, on the basis of which Ukraine wants to move to integration day, with the European Украина Union. We have lost a lot of people. We've had many victims. And for us, the life of any human being is a supreme value. But we want first and foremost to achieve peace in our country. And at the present time, any action or any statement by politicians that aims to foment hatred among people is not promising for the future, and it has nothing to do with democracy and with the normal development and blossoming of society. We recognize the fact that there is aggression, but we have come together here to talk about democracy and let us raise awareness about democracy. Let us learn democracy and let us ensure that uh, we gain experience in democracy, because as I've said, what we really want is peace, we want it to be possible for uh, every individual to live in security. I can tell you that I am proud of Ukrainians, and I am proud of the fact that this dignified revolution in Ukraine was run by civil society and not by politicians. I've often been in the West, I've met many politicians, I've met many civil society activists, and uh, they uh, all think that in December and January there was a conflict between two different groups of politicians, but not at all. It was all done by civil society. People simply had too much, and they could no longer accept what was being done by the ruling class. Uh, and the fact that uh, they were being robbed by corrupt politicians uh, was not acceptable. And this was done by the ordinary person in the street. Uh, and all calls uh, for violence, all calls uh, for hatred will be completely rejected by us. And I think what's very important is to set an example. And through our example, we will be demonstrating that Ukrainians are peace-loving, they really believe in democracy, they believe in the values that lie at the foundation of the European Union. And among those values, human rights, the lives of individuals, their health are supreme values. Let us talk about people, let us have a state for the people, a state that will make sure that people's lives can be improved, conflicts avoided, tensions reduced in a society that has suffered so much. We do not accept radical positions calling for violence, and that is why I am proud of the Ukrainian people. To defend your country is a normal reaction, but you don't need to resort to violence for that purpose. And we, in our hearts, minds, and souls, will be the bearers of peace. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, there would be very few people who would uh, disagree with Dimitro on that point. I think it was uh, 
Lenin, who said that freedom is terribly, terribly important, so important we must ration it carefully. But I'd, I'd like to just get a comment from Enrique, if I may, please, on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I fully share uh, uh, Mr. Bulatov's uh, uh, point. I think uh, a peaceful transition is crucial, uh, and uh, and a transition which uh, uh, which offers the chance to everyone participating in it. And it's uh, a democratic transition is basically about uh, participation and uh, and about uh, getting everyone on board. And I think this is the crucial uh, crucial point for uh, for Ukraine at the moment. So I think I can I can say. On, on, on behalf not only of, of my country but, but many partners of Ukraine that we keep fingers crossed and wish you the best of, of luck in, in your en uh, endeavor. If I may just uh, shortly address another question which was raised by the young lady from Turkey about women's participation. I think this is a very, uh, very crucial point, and it, it goes far beyond uh, uh, the, the uh, political perspective. It's also a, a general uh, question about uh, uh, equal treatment and, and uh, uh, the shape of democratic uh, societies. But it's also about women to get engaged, and I think this is very crucial. And I say that as, as a woman myself, I'm, I'm a civil servant, not a politician, so uh, my perspective may be a bit different, but uh, uh, but I think it's uh, it's uh, for the women uh, to to raise hands uh, and to be active uh, because women. I mean. Let me just, just draw your attention to, to the moment when Daniela asked you who of you wants to be involved politically. I haven't seen many ladies raising their hands. It's usually men who are the first to, uh, to declare that they are interested. If women do not start to be interested, they can't be helped from outside. We obviously need to get men interested in female participation in, in issues which are typically associated with women, uh, like childcare, uh, uh, like uh, education, etc. But it's for the women to take care of, uh, of that, and I think it's also a question of, of quotas, for example. Quotas are nothing bad, and uh, we should also uh, uh, be quite, quite blunt in, in claiming that, in particular in transition societies, you need quotas in order to get women on board. Otherwise, uh, it won't be uh, possible. Thank you very much. I think it's, it, it is indeed extremely important that women get involved in politics and indeed on the boards of companies because research has shown that companies with a fairly even gender split actually do much better than companies that are either all male or all female. You need a fair number, but not just women. We also need people with disabilities who are often left out or not given the, the credit they deserve, and you should be involved. When, when the European Parliament building was built next door, uh, there was one member who was in a wheelchair. One of the members of the Questers, who was also Irish, like this guy, went to see the architects and said, look, we need facilities for uh, somebody with a disability to work in this hemicycle. And when he got there, they had to put him sitting at the back behind everyone else because the architect had decided that it was unlikely that anyone who had a disability would ever get into the parliament. Fortunately, we have seen women feeding their babies in the hemicycle now. It is changing, but it's slow. We need more women. We need more people with disabilities to take a political stand and get involved. Matt wanted to have a comment on that last question. Yeah, and, and actually, just to, to add to that, I, I mean, we have to understand that this is um, a symbol for what we have to do. This is not a building for democracy. Uh, it's a wonderful building, and again, thank you to the, to the World Forum organizers for welcoming us all here, but this is not a building which makes democracy easy. And one of the painful things to watch over the last couple of days was in these various sessions to see people trying to have participatory kinds of meetings and exercises in rooms where chairs are bolted to the floor, <laughs> where tables can't be moved, uh, where we have situations like this where all the focal point is on one set of people. So, so we need to be thinking about the infrastructure for democracy, just like we have an infrastructure for the Republican parts of our systems. I also wanted to say something about the tragedy of these nonviolent democratic movements. I mean, it is a tragedy that people have to make these kinds of sacrifices and commitments uh, to get their Republican and, and democratic rights. And I want to honor some of those sacrifices by pointing out that these are not simply, in most cases, these are not simply movements for democracy. These are internally democratic movements. 
when you look at the way people are organizing and have organized in the Arab Spring and all kinds of places, they are giving people significant, meaningful chances to participate in shaping the future and direction of the movement. They're giving people chances to talk about why they care, to weigh different options and choices, to plan for action. People are using both thick kinds of participation, they're interpersonal and uh, in intensive and face-to-face, -face, and thin kinds, using colonizing Facebook, all these different kinds of uses of online technology that we've seen in many of these movements. They use these because democratic tactics work. But what do they get when they actually succeed in toppling a government? What they get are Republican reforms. And we have seen this time and time again all over the world in cases where we have democratic movements that produce only Republican rights, only Republican more representation, which is good. We want those rights. We want to be able to vote. All of those things are important. But we also want and need, partly because they work, opportunities to participate, to act together, to be Democrats in addition to, to Republicans. Our, our picture, our, our stereotype of, of all of these movements is that they are situations where we have protesters who are trying to become citizens. And in fact, it may be the other way around. We have movements we give, which give people the chance to be citizens, but when they end up with a government that does not honor those kinds of commitments, it does not give those kinds of opportunities, what they end up being is nothing more than protesters. Natasha wants to make a comment on this last uh, round of questions too. We haven't got much time left, folks, so keep your next questions very short. Yes, just uh, briefly. There was a question on, on the, the support of developed democracies to uh, new democracies, and I would like to, to, to answer that question from the perspective of Serbia. Uh, actually, I think that we can all agree that the support has been in many cases, uh, uh, really, uh, really big from the point of view of bilateral economic uh, um, assistance, um, civil society, party cooperation, uh, exchange of experience, ideas, and so on. But at the same time, let us be frank and say that, well, developed democracies have their own agendas and their own priorities. And there is very important that we are aware that very often they are willing, able, and they do that. They close their eyes if there are some lack of democratic um, uh, standards and values in the case their priorities are met. I mean, so that is something that we, sh uh, we should be aware of. It shouldn't discourage us in, uh, in, our, in our countries to fight for those democratic standards in spite of um, that unwillingness on the side of international actors and some developed democracies and their governments to see those um, uh, democratic defaults in our country. Thank you. I, I, I want to take more questions, but I know that Daniela does want to make one comment about the tendency of people who get into politics to become corrupted. If you just make it very short, please, Daniela. <laughs> I will make it very short. Um, I just want to thank for the question and say that it's, uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I, you know, you have to ask that question yourself every single day when you enter politics, because it's not, it's not easy. And politics are dirty, and it's extremely frustrating. <laughs> uh, but if you get discouraged or if you are afraid, too afraid of it, then you cannot complain. Um, you have to enter the system and work within and fight every single day against that, uh, that corruption and against that uh, way of doing politics. And uh, it is not easy, it's very hard, but it's possible. And if you think you're getting close to, uh, you know, getting discouraged, then get out. Uh, but don't, uh, do not not try, <laughs> you know, try. And if you don't like it, then get out. But don't be afraid of trying. I think I'm I'm just going to say that we do have to end exactly on time at 11 because Dimitro has to, has to go. Um, and also I've been reminded that you have to be back here at 11.30 because that's when the next session starts. So many questions, so little time. There's a lady up there with a, with a blue hat on. There are many blue hats, in fact. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'm Buyana Shavoli. I'm from Kosovo. 
And I've, I know that it's really hard to engage to political parties, but we know that we can engage to them by acting against and complain, complaining against the people who pretend that we don't exist. Um, I think that it is important uh, for no, no matter how old a person are, is, uh, it's important to feel young inside. Do you think that, that with this high level of participants in this form of democracy, at least we created a little bit of fear to these people who pretend that we do not, do not exist? Thank you. Okay. Gen gentlemen, gentlemen there. Thank you. I have a very brief comment. I'm from Azerbaijan. My name is Azerbaijan. Now our colleague from Georgia raised this issue and I'd like to speak to some of the Azerbaijan citizens in July of this year. The three Azerbaijan citizens found themselves on the territory of the Azerbaijan government. Вот вопрос не в том, что они попали туда. Вопрос в том, что сейчас эта военная хунта там их судит за незаконный переход границы. Какой границы? Это же они находились на территории Азербайджана. Is charging them for the illegal crossing of a border, but I mean, what's that border? That's as by law, it's Azerbaijani territory. But the trouble is that Armenian civil society and international organizations are not reacting to this. I mean, we're calling on international communities to react. I mean, these are simply citizens who found themselves on territory where they had been born and where they lived. A debate that isn't really to do with our, our question. I know there is a gentleman from Armenia here who wants to wants to respond to, to that. Can you keep it very short, please? Because we want to take questions on young people and democracy, not on existing conflicts. I represent the Yerevan School of Political Studies, but I wouldn't have asked for the floor if we hadn't heard what we just heard from an Azerbaijani colleague. I mean, let us speak to the facts without excessive emotion. I mean, the case that's been referred to has been investigated and all the facts are known, but I mean, we really need here to talk about democracy. It, it is possible, of course, to resolve this conflict. We can't do it alone. We have to do it together. It has to be done by politicians on both sides. But we here can at least uh, uh, exchange our views, uh, and, but let us uh, not uh, uh, sling mud at one another. I mean, uh, let us not to try to make the other side feel guilty. That's not going to resolve the problem. We are beginning to run out of time for questions. There's a, a lady over there with a blue hat. Um, if you'd like to, yes, I have a flag. Go on. The Ukrainian flag. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, attention. Uh, I know that Europe is already tired of Ukraine as well, but I again grab your attention to our situation, and my question is following. Uh, you know, democracy is very weak in the time of war, and election, parliamentary election took place in Ukraine just a week ago, uh, a little uh, more time, and we uh, see that uh, democratic uh, parties are split again, and we will have a, a competition between uh, party of uh, our president and uh, prime minister's party. What can we do to uh, make our democracy stronger? Of course, this competition is essential in democracy process, but we have war now on the East. How can we manage with it? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we, we really are getting very close for time now. So the gentleman down here, I know, uh, would like to ask a question. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Stelsky Mbouyopoulos, I'm from Greece, and I have uh, two very short questions to you. Uh, do you know the subtopic of this World Forum for Democracy? It's, uh, uh, can the youth revitalize democracy? So my question is, my main question is, why you sit on this upper level instead of us? Uh, 
It's a good question. <laughs> it's a, that, that is a very good question. We, we will, I'm going to try to get everyone to answer it in, in a matter of seconds. There's a gentleman, I think, over, where is he? Over there. Yes, the gentleman with the, with the fair hair and the grey T-shirt. Yes, you. That's right. Hi, my name's Chris Wheeler. Um, I'm from the UK and I'm one of the youth representatives here at the forum. Um, just a quick response to what uh, Ms Chacon said. Uh, she said that young people, we, we hear across the world that young people are apathetic and uninterested in politics. And actually, this is something that's heard across the world, heard in my country as well. I don't think this is true. What young people are, what young people are apathetic to are the political institutions who isolate us from power and keep it as an elite club. We are not against politics. We are merely against the current political institutions who do not work for us. Well, I, I, I was going to get everybody on the panel here to, to give a brief summing up, but I think you've already summed up the entire argument in that one question. But I, I am going to do that because we, we have run very, very short of time. And I've been told that everyone here has to have a last, no more than 30 seconds, please, a maximum. So let, let's start with Dimitro over there, please, but make it very short, please. I would just like to say that uh, democracy needs to be built top down but bottom up as well. You need to start with the individuals, you need to start with the bottom up. I mean, people waste a lot of time criticizing others uh, and they could use that time and energy to do something positive, to engage in some good action and if everyone does that, uh, uh, then, uh, then, of course, we'll achieve something all together. So start with yourselves, so start with your individuals, and that uh, will result in mutual understanding among peoples, uh, and that will result in democracy. To talk about what should be done elsewhere and not do it in one's own country, that means uh, that one is not really following the path to democracy. Thank you. A very short response from you, please. Um, yes, I agree. Uh, young people are apathetic to the political system. And, uh, you know, we're right <laughs> because it doesn't let us to participate and it doesn't let us to make decisions. But I do think that we can answer yes to the question on can youth revitalize democracy? Uh, definitely. This is the forum. This is what we're doing. I just want to encourage you to go back to your countries and continue to do what you're doing, continue to encourage and uh, other young, other youth to continue to participate in whether it's civil society, whether it's politics. As long as you are participating and encouraging other people to participate, we are going to have more and more spaces every single day. Thank you. Okay. Philip, next. Point number one, I believe that you have the capacity. I don't believe that somebody needs to, needs to bring you the breakfast in bed or push you like this because those of you who can, they shall, they will. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, uh, symbolically speaking, sitting here, has been tried a number of times in the past seven or eight thousand years uh, to abolish this. The point is not to abolish it, the point is to have the people sitting here changing. And this is what democracy is. It is not about abolishing levels. It is about abolishing the privilege of being all the time on one and the same level. Okay, Enrique. I could stick to echoing what Philip Dimitrov just said and, and limit myself to that, but I just say one, one sentence more on, on Ukraine. I think uh, what you really need is a consensus on your main political objectives. If you want uh, an Euro-Atlantic integration, you have to get your uh, parties to agree on that and uh, I think this was the, the basic for, for the successful transformation in Poland. We had many internal struggles, we had uh, lots of parties in the parliament, lots of uh, fights uh, for many issues but we had a general consensus on the direction which we are heading, meaning the European Union. Thank you. Okay, Matt, you're next. If we're going to rethink democracy we've got to get past three bad assumptions. One, that Government is the only institution that can solve public problems. All kinds of other groups and all of us individually can help solve public problems. Two, bad assumption, is that government alone is the one that's responsible for creating participation in democracy. All of us and all of our organizations need to, to, to recognize that we have a, 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 
a stake in democracy and participation, and we need to all support it. And third, the last bad assumption is that democracy or participation somehow is like spinach. It's good for us, but we don't like it. It can, in fact, be fun. And over the last couple of days and this morning, we saw all, many of you kind of demonstrating how fun democracy and participation can be, and, and I want to thank you for that. Quick bit of campaigning for Popeye there. <laughs> and I like spinach anyway. And finally, <laughs> Natasha. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I would like to encourage all of you who want to, to join political life to do so. And uh, we all bring our own uh, educational family background, our sense of morality into this political life. There are no guarantees except those that we bear with us. So I think that uh, uh, we... Uh, 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 you really have to, uh, to well, to, to get active, to, to, to become politically active and to, to, to bring change that we all want to happen. Thank you. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank everybody on the panel, first of all. Thank you all very much. I wish we'd had more time. I wish we'd had a chance to take all of the questions from the floor. It would have been here all day. But we do have a young person who's going to read the Peace Security Agreement. Uh, that is uh, being signed here. And uh, if that person is here, would they please come to the dais in the middle, please? Okay, right. Um, you must have listened to this gentleman here. Oh, the lady too. Hi, brothers and sisters. We, the young people from the World Forum of Democracy, have come together to sign the peace security agreement from signatories of more than 36 countries, including young people from Ukraine and the Russian Federation. In fact, more than half of them. Um, we are committed to nonviolence and to each other's security and mutual peace through relational interdependence, honest communication, and advocacy on each other's behalf. So for those of you who agree and who have kindly signed it yesterday, uh, please come forward to shake hands on this agreement and to have our photo taken. Yeah, please. Thank you. I know it's hard to get out of these chairs and whatnot, but... Yeah, it yeah. would be really nice if you would come Maybe forward. Maybe it's our chance. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I just would remind you that you all have to be back here at 11.30 sharp, please. From us on the panel, goodbye and thank you. <laughs>